So welcome everybody to, uh, to today's webinar. Um, we're going to, we're here today to hear about the uh, tool chest for professionals, which we have developed as part of the Voices for Justice project. Um, the tool chest is intended to help people with disabilities who are victims of crime. Um, it, it was, um, it's meant to be practical. It's intended to provide uh, focused guidance to professionals and to persons with disabilities um, about the kinds of challenges and barriers to accessing justice and how to remove those barriers um, and enable uh, people with disabilities who are victims of crime to be able to access justice and participate fully in the justice process. It's very much um, part of the work of the Voices for Justice project and um, really feeds into what we've been doing for the past couple of years on uh, reviewing and researching and raising awareness of the kinds of barriers that people with disabilities are experiencing when they try to access justice. The project Voices for Justice has been running for two and a half years now. This is its, this is our last month of operation, December. So we, we, we are completing at the end of December this year. Um, it's an EU co-funded project. Um, it carried out research into the experiences of people with disabilities in the justice system in seven EU countries, um, Bulgaria, Croatia, Czechia, Slovakia, Romania, Slovenia and Lithuania. And really we were trying to find out how people with disabilities access justice. What are their experiences? How do they report a crime? Are they able to participate in an investigation? And do they get their day in court? Do they get justice? Are they able to um, access justice and the justice system? And um, our work started by carrying out research at the national and then the international levels. And I think that even we were quite shocked to find the extent to which people with disabilities were, are, were excluded from the justice system. Um, the barriers they were experiencing were almost impenetrable. Um, these were physical barriers, attitudinal, plain discrimination, institutional, cultural, legal. It seemed like from all angles, they were um, unable to actually reach, um, uh, yeah, reach the justice system as victims of crime. Um, and this tool chest is very much about helping professionals to bring down those barriers, to, to work out ways which exist. <laughs> um, they need some effort, some skill, and they need um, what we've called a, a human approach. Um, to be motivated to include people as they are legally, uh, um, as their rights are to access justice. So the kind of barriers that we identified um, around information and communication, where information is produced in a complex legal language, the letter of rights, for example, is not, is not uh, made accessible or not translated into a non-technical language that people can easily understand certainly not easily available in easy read forms or audio forms. Um, uh, the physical barriers, uh, these still are, are pervasive um, in almost all justice systems, difficulty accessing a police station, a courtroom, and even where there are uh, facilities provided or access is provided, for example, to a court, a courthouse, Perhaps, you know, it can be that the lifts are inaccessible, the, the waiting rooms are inaccessible, um, the witness briefing rooms are inaccessible. So, you know, access really needs to be extended and expanded so that, um, that, that buildings are fully accessible, um, not just in a token way. Um, the kind of attitudinal barriers as well, where um, there's a quote here, a, a family, uh, we got harassed a lot, we called the police about it several times. We wrote a complaint to the police, but there was no reply. They said that we were weird. Um, uh, police who, who we, we heard them saying that people, witnesses or victims may look unreliable. They don't seem credible. Where judgments are made based on, a, on an attitude or assumption or stereotyping and just discrimination. Um, 
I think also uh, legal capacity not being granted to people fully is, is also a, a barrier for many people trying to access justice. So those were like a very quick uh, snapshot of some of the barriers that we identified um, in, in the research that we carried out and that are, are presented in the tool chest. And today the idea is that we hear from some of the partners on the project, experts and professionals who are working on the front line with people with disabilities, standing up for their rights, supporting access to justice for them. Um, and uh, also we will, we will hear from them and their different perspectives, different professional perspectives um, that will be contained in the tool chest. So the tool chest is really aimed at a range of professionals. At, it's aimed at lawyers, at social workers and carers, at victim support services, and really anybody else who comes across or is in contact with someone with a disability who may be a victim of a crime. Um, and by putting the information together, we're hoping that it really gives emphasizes the need for a cross-disciplinary perspective and approach. This is very often missing where uh, professionals do not feel confident or do not understand what other support is available. For example, asking a, a speech therapist, asking a carer to help, even some quite simple steps that can be taken. So the tool chest brings the different, uh, different guidance together in a more holistic way to try and um, address uh, some of these barriers from the different perspectives to provide the tools that people need in order to be able to start to uh, support people with disabilities properly to access justice. Um, I'm going to hand over now to our first uh, presenter, uh, Georgiana Pascu. Um, she is the program manager and advocate for on the Advocate for Dis Dignity program at the Center for Legal Resources in Romania. And um, she is going to talk uh, from a legal practitioner perspective. Um, so thank you, Georgiana. I will hand the floor to you. Um, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And. Uh, Thank you for the invitation. Um, I will start to share my screen if it's okay with uh, everybody. Okay. Here we are. Okay. Hope it's uh, it's okay. Good. So, first of all, I will uh, start by uh, looking at the data in uh, in Romania and how we will use this experience on uh, working in this uh, multidisciplinary project. So if we look at the, I don't know, few statistical information about uh, the rights of persons with intellectual and with psychosocial disabilities in Romania, we will see, for instance, that Romania occupied the last place in the European Union in terms of accessibility of justice for persons with disabilities. So, few data, for instance, um, in Romania, uh, a person with intellectual uh, disabilities or with a psychosocial disabilities has a bigger chance to uh, be a victim of violence especially if this person will live in a um, social care or in a psychiatric uh, hospital. Then if we look at the uh, death rates in institutions, also this is 16, 16 times higher than uh, for the ordinary hospitals. Uh, only one percentage of courts ensure accessibility in terms of information for persons with disabilities. And as an example, our uh, justice uh, web page is not accessible for persons with disabilities and only 2% of police stations are communicatively accessible. So, I mean, these are not uh, uh, very optimistic information about our country 
but we are trying to change this in the next uh, in the next period using this uh, experience from the project so how we would like to do this first of all we will look at the police and judicial staff at the prosecutors and judges and at the lawyers for instance using these tools we will have to look at uh, uh, how the police for instance officers will ensure that all the information that they will provide to the victim victim are in an accessible uh, uh, format then what are the uh, means that they can use and how they can use different instruments or tools in order to provide um, better in order to better communicate with a person with intellectual disabilities for instance um, also here we will have to look at the barriers so especially when we are speaking with a person with intellectual disabilities in a police uh, station we have to see if uh, this uh, person really understand the information and uh, then try to check uh, if everything is provided in order with the rules uh, for this the police and the judicial staff also they will have to um, organize this kind of individual assessment uh, an individual assessment that usually should be done in partnership or in collaboration with a social worker based on this individual assessment uh, the police and the judicial staff should uh, uh, provide to the court and to the prosecutors and also for the lawyers with what are the procedural accommodations that the person might need for instance uh, there are some person with intellectual disabilities that might ask for a um, communication facilitator or supporters also uh, there might be person that already have an interpreter and the police officer should be in touch with this one secondly at the level of the prosecutors and judges both have a duty to ensure the participation rights of victims with disabilities and in order to do this the first thing that they should look for is this individual assessment and if the procedural accommodations have been provided to this person also the prosecutor should look how a case is managed and how hearings and questioning are conducted again as in the police uh, uh, station situation if the person with uh, uh, intellectual disabilities is not really uh, understanding the questions and if the uh, environment or the room is not uh, uh, in a way that will help the person to um, answer at the questions then this is not okay um, then um, it should be checked how the hearings are scheduled and how other facilities or equipment are used at the level of the lawyers again it's very important that lawyers act under the instruction of the victim with disabilities this means that there might be um, uh, situations when the lawyers should ask for a communication facilitator and also if the person with disabilities has a legal guardian the lawyer should also be in touch with this one now here uh, uh, from our experience from romania the situation sh show us that uh, uh, we have to underline the fact that uh, if the person with disabilities has a legal guardian this doesn't mean that the lawyer should not communicate with the person with disabilities um, also the lawyer should be in touch with the social workers again they should be uh, in our case they should be provided by the uh, social services and uh, should check if the procedural accommodation uh, was uh, uh, identified so they should they should go back to the individual assessment um, the lawyers should check uh, if the person with disability understand everything and they should also 
be sure that they will inform the uh, person in every step of the criminal proceeding, proceeding about their role and also provide information of any decisions made in their case. Now, um, using these tools and uh, uh, our experience at the end of this project, what uh, we would like to do in the next 12 months is to train and deploy uh, 15 communication supporters in six first instance courts in Romania. Also to provide legal support in institutions using these uh, tools again in our teams made by a lawyer, a social worker and a self-representative with uh, intellectual or with psychosocial disabilities. We are working at an app in an accessible format for complaints also to be used by institutionalized persons with intellectual disabilities and we are working on a multidisciplinary uh, packing training for um, judges, prosecutors, police officers, social workers and uh, psychologists. So the idea is that uh, to enforce all of these instruments, specifically individual assessment and procedural accommodations, and uh, to be sure that uh, a person with, uh, with disabilities can, can have access to, to justice. Thank you so much, Paula. Thank you. Thank you, Georgiana. Thank you. That, that was um, really interesting, focused, and thank you for highlighting so well um, the specific ways in which lawyers can engage with and work with other professionals and the fundamental importance of um, respecting the legal capacity of people with disabilities. Um, and also uh, an inspiring to-do list. So I'm hoping that, um, I took a screenshot of it actually, so I'm, I'm hoping very much that we can all take inspiration from that uh, and uh, take on the practical application of this work and the, the use to which we can put this tool chest. So thank you again, Georgiana. Um, I would now like to hand to uh, Miran Speck from Victim and Witness Support Croatia. Um, who will talk more from the victim support perspective. Um, thank you, Miran. Thank you, Paula. Uh, good day, everybody. Uh, and thank you, Validity, for inviting Victim Support Croatia to this webinar. Also would like to thank entire consortium from the Voice from Justice Project because Victim Support have learned a lot in exchange of knowledge and in exchange of practice between the participating countries in this project. So uh, at the beginning, I have to say that unfortunately, my colleague Maya, who also was planned to talk about the victim support organization and their responsibilities, is unable to join us today because of the COVID, but I'm bearing the entire presentation, so I hope that everything is going to be okay. And I would like to share my presentation. I hope that you can see the presentation and that everything is okay. I will remain the presentation in this format because it can easily be switched. And my role today is to present to you the part of the tool chest, as we have already heard from the Georgiana, concerning the chapter about victim support services and their roles and responsibilities. Let's start from the Victim Support Europe, who, if you don't know, is the network stated in Belgium and consists of the numerous institutions and NGOs working and providing support to victims and witnesses. Uh, for decades, the Victim Support Europe, and especially the few weeks ago, presenting the victim-centered approach in, in the process of support. They're also presenting the new standardized framework that would be excellent tool for the all EU member states in providing support. To be honest, we at Victim Support Croatia have been learned from Victim Support Europe about this victim-centered approach, or if you wish, it's a victim-tailored support, meaning that the victim is always in the center, not the perpetrator, not the justice system, not the NGOs for support, but the victim itself with its social support network 
and of course with the generic and special support. So the idea is that the EU country, every and each member of the EU country has developed generic support for the victim and witnesses and special support for the victims and witnesses, which would then be perfectly in, in organizing support for the people with disabilities when they are either victims or witnesses. This should be appointed in, as I said, most of the EU countries with all the legislation that comes in this. If you wish to learn more, you can visit the Victim Support Europe web page for next. But when we talk about victim support services in um, conjunction with the people with disabilities, we at Victim Support Croatia and the tool chest, if you read it from the, the beginning to the end, propose that an excellent support system, either on the side of institutions or the NGOs, but uh, in these terms, let's say, focus on the NGOs that provide support, should consist of several acts and documents in order that um, this support is professional, comprehensive, and always that the victim is in the center. Meaning that Convention on the Rights of the Person of Disabilities should be the priority, with the European Director on the Minimal Standards of the Victim's Rights, who is currently under revision, EU Strategy on the Victim's Rights, that lasts from 2025 and the, if possible, developed national strategies on the victim support and the national strategies on the people with disabilities. When have these all documents and the roles from these documents, the support service could and will go in the right direction concerning the support for the people with disabilities. This should also be said that um, and recognized that the victim needs are always recognition of the crime, the recognition of the victim herself, and access to justice and access to support service, because not all EU members have the standardization in access to justice and access to support. What we also need is access to compensation for victims and access to restoration justice. This should be the main goals of support service in each EU countries dealing with victims and specialized with victims with disabilities. Even the directive on a minimal standards says, and this is something that we have also inputted in the tool chest, that the support service in each EU countries should include as a minimum, the provision of information or the different kinds of informations. If you exclude the victim and put any other kind of subject in relation to the information, you would understand that the information is a key, is very important, specialized, and especially when we talk with the people with different kinds of disabilities. So the support service should include information about the victim's rights, as the Paula said at the beginning, that is easily explained, reliable to each individual person with disability. Also, information on how to access compensation schemes if existing or possible in EU countries, information about the role in the criminal proceedings, including preparation for attendance at trial. What means preparation for attendance at trial? Meaning that the victim is psychologically firm in giving statement to the court or other public prosecutor or police, that she understands or he understands who sits where in the criminal proceedings, who is who and what role has the prosecution, legal advisors, judges, panel or the defenders. Also, information about and where appropriate referral system and specialty support service, which, which is crucial in the multidisciplinary approach. While providing information, it's crucial that the support worker or volunteer of support provides support with emotional support and that those information also are in conjunction with emotional support. Where needed, we need to develop strong psychosocial and psychological support. Also, from the case of Croatia, we need psychological support that is spread throughout the country, easily reliable, and, it don't, it, and uh, the crucial is that it does not depend on the financial deeds from the state. Also, the minimal standard should be advised on the risk and prevention of any kind of secondary and repeated victimization. 
So our tool chest in the chapter eight is giving guidance to all of you and the particular role of the victim support services should and need to play for the victims with disabilities. The key points are providing accessible support and information, same as the directive or the minimal standards says, carrying out an individual needs assessment, which Georgiana said a little bit earlier, contributing to a multidisciplinary approach, and at the end, but not the last, facilitating access to procedural accommodation. Now, when we talk about providing accessible support and information, and more can be read at the chapter five of our tool chest, it's about emotional and psychological support, which depends on effective two-way communication with people with disabilities. So we have to be sure that information that we are providing are understand, understood by the victim with disabilities. And if she or he has a questions about certain victim rights, rights that we can explain it and put it in the practical work. Also, accessible information about their rights and the justice system, how the criminal procedure looks like, how the administrative system looks like. As I said before, who is who in the criminal procedure and what is the role of the individual in the criminal procedure role? If needed, we need to be either educated or have the specialties in our organization in order to provide all material or tools like a tool chest that we are today presenting that can provide those information on easy read material, plain language, audio, braille, or sign language. This is crucial. We need to have a certain types of interpreters as the criminal procedure system have to have interpreters at all time willing to interpret certain situation, certain procedure, or certain information to the victims. Also, when we are lacking certain expertise, we should be reliable and make either local, regional, or national uh, multi friendships or cooperation partnerships, if you wish, with certain other agencies or support services. Anybody who can help us in order to provide us communication uh, with the victims of disabilities. This is more, more crucial to the institutions who are communicating with the victims than with the support providers, but the support providers should have either tools or, as I said, tool chests or interpreters in their organization in order to provide this. When we talk about carrying out of individual needs or risk assessment, this is, let's say, for some EU countries, a new tool. For some EU countries, it is a tool that is still developing or redeveloping. And in Croatia, we have used individual needs assessment from 2017 with 2019 revision. And this is an excellent tool for a point of the victim support organization. In some EU countries, this is the obligation from the state actors like police, prosecution, and judges. But um, our experience have learned us that it is an excellent way that uh, individual victim support organization also do the individual needs or risk assessment of a certain victim. And then either recommunicate this with a system that is obligated in providing assessment or to use our own recommendation towards the system where we have found a crucial needs or risk on the side of the victims. What we have learned and we have inputted in this tool chest is that um, individual assessment is a very valuable tool to identify communication barriers, information provision to the victims. Uh, in many EU countries, it is found as a tool to provide protection or additional protection or procedural protection measures for the victims. But we have, what we have found through our research, uh, meaning the entire consortium of this project, that this tool should be an effective tool, as I said before, for reaching out effective communication and information with the victims, so that in continuing of criminal proceeding, entire system understands how to communicate and pass the information to the victims. Uh, as I said before, it's not only about needs of the victims, it could also be about risk that is circled about the, the victims. And sometimes victim support organizations have more information about these needs or this risk than the institution itself. It's because either the victim have approached the victim support organization prior to the public institution, 
who have revealed more information about herself or her family concerning the certain crime. And that's why it's very crucial that victim support organization communicate with public bodies in transfer of such knowledge or such informations. When talking about multidisciplinary approach, which is something that we've already heard before, and I have mentioned also, the victim support organization should at all time be part of any kind of multidisciplinary teams and approach in working with people with disabilities. For example, in Croatia, we have on the county level, multidisciplinary teams on combating domestic violence and gender-based violence which meaning that in these schemes are the police, prosecution, other NGOs, courts, or any other institution or body that deal, deals with any kind of support to victims. The goal of such teams are to communicate on a practical level and try to exchange knowledge and experience in providing of, or provision of support to victims. Also, uh, we have to make in mind that a victim support worker is regularly a prime contact for a victim with a public body or with a justice system. In many EU countries, after adoption of the minimum standard director of the European Union, the victim, one of the victim rights right is also a person of trust. The person of trust can be a member family of the victim, but is usually a member of a victim support organization. Take this opportunity to use this multidisciplinary approach and to be a primary contact for a victim. And the last, but not, but not the least, is the facilitating access to procedural accommodation. So we have to act as a facilitator between the body, with state, institution, and the victim herself, and professionals in the justice system. We can see, like in individual needs assessment or risk assessment, what are the barriers for the victim? How can these barriers can be overachieved and how to help the system to accommodate a victim and to provide individual support so that the support is timely and relevant to the stage of the criminal procedure and well as a particular needs of individual and barriers. And I would like to end with one of the quotation in the tool chest provided from our partners from Czechia, which is an excellent uh, example how the system of multidisciplinary approach and information and the system of sensibility should act. When a victim approach a victim support organization, prior to the filing the criminal complaint, the communication between the victim support and the police station in turn that when a victim with a disability arrives should be received with sensibility, that the question should be asked sensitively, and that approach is everything that we have said before. So I would like to thank again Validity and Czechia for this excellent opportunity. So if you have any questions or remarks, we can stay at the end. Thank you. One more. Paula? Miran, uh, thank you so much for that um, very insightful and comprehensive um, look into the details of the role of victim support services and how crucial they are in uh, supporting the provision of a, a truly victim-centered approach, and also for identifying so clearly the very specific roles they can play in facilitating procedural accommodations, which are often so fundamental uh, to the practical ability of um, for people with disabilities to access justice, to be able to report the crime in the police station, to uh, be involved properly in the investigation and to actively participate in any uh, hearings or trials. So th thank you very much, um, Miran. Um, I would like now to pass on to Andras Kapush and Katarina fitzko Mau who are from the Social Protection Institute of the Republic of Slovenia and the University of Slovenia. And they bring a slightly more academic perspective, very specifically um, a social work perspective um, and with a particular expertise in multidisciplinary working. So thank you, Andras and Katarina. Uh, hello to all the listeners and other participants. Thank you for inviting us to this uh, webinar. Um, I must say it was a great honor uh, working on this project and also on this tool chest. 
um, since this is such an important uh, topic, uh, not only for the um, legal, uh, to the changes in the legal justice system, but also to the changes in the system of uh, care in the European Union. Uh, let me start my uh, presentation. Uh, so, as uh, Paula said, we will focus more on social work and a little bit multidisciplinary teams. Um, uh, Paul already mentioned that there, uh, uh, what we found in this project is that there is a profound absence of people uh, with disabilities exercising in their participation rights and witness in the justice system in European Union. Um, this is nothing really new. Uh, for us as social workers because there there is a long tradition uh, of social workers dealing with the issues of visibility people and inclusion of the people with disabilities into the communities um, it is a traditionally important work in social work to try to identify report and deal with the consequences of crime um, especially violence and uh, uh, crimes that are connected with the um, lack of possibility to exercise human rights. Um, as uh, Georgiana and Miran also uh, focused on is the part of the uh, legal process and uh, I will try to maybe also include the uh, how this connects to the uh, community and other professionals. Um, one of the inter interviewees that we um, uh, were questioning said that at the end of the interview that it's best to be neither a perpetrator nor a victim if you are a person with disabilities and you're, uh, have in, you have to be included in the uh, legal, legal, any kind of legal procedure. Um, I think it's important to, uh, to include the perspective uh, when we talk about the legal uh, procedures that the, they are not, um, separate from the life of people with disabilities. They, so it is important to talk about uh, people's rights in the legal process, but we also have to connect this to the life of uh, people because this is only a small part of their uh, life. So when we talk about the support and social work and uh, other types of support, we have to talk about support during the uh, criminal justice process, but also beyond it so um, in the in our tool chest we made a framework for assessing and providing support to victims with disabilities um, the part of the assessment and uh, accessible communication uh, were, were already presented uh, by the previous presenters and um, maybe i should also stress out that that uh, a crucial part of um having uh, um, human rights established for the person is also to um, not only enable the best possible legal process, but uh, also to try to uh, use this opportunity to empower the person and establish um, support to decision-making, but also to include them into the general support in the public, uh, in the community. Uh, it is important to know that people with disabilities uh, are more prone to be victims of crime. Uh, so um, this has to be uh, connected to, to, to dealing uh, with this in the established services, but also trying to find new ways uh, to support them. Um, when we were thinking about how to connect social workers and uh, um, weakness support workers with the legal professionals, um, we tried to see how this would uh, function in the team, uh, in the uh, multidisciplinary teamwork. I think it's important that we see that, that the both positions are important to, uh, first of all, establish what a person uh, with disabilities needs in the legal process and beyond it, but also trying to establish 
their voice and their human rights. Um, from the legal perspective, uh, legal perspective, a lot of knowledge uh, uh, has been made and it, it's used to dealing with protection of rights, managing the legal proceedings, directed, directed support with the um, victims and also conflict resolution. Uh, so, and from the social work side is uh, the, our knowledge of, of the comprehensive assessment of the situation and the needs and then support and also acquiring resources that would help the person with disabilities uh, come together uh, so that we can uh, protect the, victim, uh, the victims and uh, also support them. Uh, so um, I think that uh, we have to, to think about this way uh, to, again, uh, deal with the immediate problems with the person with disabilities entering the legal process uh, and the consequences and the stress of the process and so on. But then also to think about how this can be opportunity to, um, to, to start establishing people of disabilities uh, uh, rights in the community. Um, my team, uh, other from this project, the strong work we are trying to do is um, decentralization for, for persons with disabilities. So uh, closing the big institutions and establishing support in the uh, community and uh, especially uh, uh, in big institutions, but also as we saw in the um, Bulgaria, small uh, houses can be problematic because they are uh, closing the space of people with disabilities. So the blank space is especially seen in institutions and uh, and the small um, uh, residential homes. So I will give my word to uh, Katerina now, who will explain more uh, on the uh, example how um, this blank, blank space uh, is um, happening uh, and how we, we can uh, uh, try to um, deal with, with this uh, issue from the social world, but also from the uh, legal perspective. Thank you, Katerina. Yes, thank you, Andres. Uh, so yes, like Andraj mentioned, uh, we work a lot on the institutionalization and during the research uh, that was done within uh, the project Voices for Justice, uh, in Slovenia, several interviews and workshops were done with people uh, with disabilities who live in institutions and also with some of the staff members. Uh, and during these interviews, a lot of participants highlighted uh, different types of violence and crime that is happening in institution that they experienced or observed. Um, and as uh, Andraj mentioned, the, the blank space, especially institutions, uh, crime that happens often stays hidden and unaddressed. Um, it is happening far from the society in often isolated places uh, with very poor access to community. And there are also some different rules in, in the institution and in the community. So uh, something that could be seen or would be seen as violence in a family, for example, or in school is not recognized as violence when it happens in the institution. Uh, crime uh, in institution is rarely reported to the police. Uh, there is more chance of report if the residents of institutions are violent against, against staff member, but not the other way around. Uh, and crime is often minimized and accepted as part of everyday life. Um, people with disabilities often said that there is nothing that can be done. Some have bad experience reporting that they weren't taken taken seriously and um, some are also losing hope. Why would I report? Why would I um, tell the staff what is going on or call the police? Um, nothing ever changes even if we do that. Um, responses for the victims of violence is um, 
also poor, so victims are often left with very little support or with no support. And there is no real understanding of what happened, what kind of support do they need, um, what kind of support do they want. Uh, for example, um, in one group home, a woman was raped by two men and um, one, one of these men was, was transferred to another group home, but one kept living with the victim uh, because staff didn't see that he did anything wrong because he was just filming the act. Uh, and also in this situation, no report to the police was made. Um, People with disabilities, but also staff that works in the institution are often not informed enough about the rights of people with disabilities and about uh, victims' rights. Um, and on the other hand, also professionals in the communities um, who work in support services are often avoiding people with disabilities. They either have some prejudice or the, some expressed even fear that they're, they're not trained enough to communicate or to offer support to people with disabilities. Um, and we do see, like Andras mentioned, that the installation is a part of the answer. Um, that we need to we need to do this uh, go through with this pro process, but it needs to, we need to be careful um, of what kind of support is provided in the community because there is a high risk of just transferring this institutional culture to smaller settings uh, like group homes, and these new answers and support uh, really needs to be uh, based on rights of uh, persons with uh, disabilities. Um, so you can put the next slide, Andres. Um, so based on the research that was done and all the interviews, um, we decided to organize a workshop uh, in the institution for people with disabilities who live in the institution on recognizing and preventing violence, on victims' rights, um, and discussing different solutions, what should be done better, how can we do it differently. Um, and during this discussion, people shared different experience um, of violence and coercive uh, practices in institutions. Um, and some of these are not especially uh, coercive practices like um, forced hospitalization, restraint, um, are not even seen as crime um, because they are um, legalized. So it's a, it, it's a bit of a complex discussion also, um, but it was very clear where, when people described what happened that it, it really sounded like violence and they did um, feel it like violence. Uh, for example, some people said they were being tied all night to a bed in a psychiatric hospital. Um, one person uh, complained about the forced medicalization. Um, one person said they were being raped by another resident in a psychiatric hospital, um, or that it was very humiliating when they were being admitted to the hospital and they were um, they got a command to strip them totally and stand naked in front of the group of staff. Um, some experienced trauma. For example, one woman said that they that she still has nightmares from the from the time that she was put in the restraint jacket. And uh, three women actually reported of being admitted to the institution after reporting domestic violence. So we could say they instead of support they they were supposed to get they were somehow punished institutionalized because of what they were experience at uh, experiencing at home um when we were talking about the different solutions uh, what should change what uh, what uh, what do people with disability need um the main points uh that uh, that they uh, pointed out the key points um, I think connect very well with the research that was done within the project and also with the tool chest. Um, so uh, they mentioned that advocacy of rights of uh, persons with disabilities in this kind of situation is very important and should be accessible. Um, that legislation that allows coercion and these bad practices 
should be changed. And that is very important to listen and try to understand. So it's very important that professionals ask the right questions, that they are supportive, that they believe the victim and that they um, also act accordingly. So they don't just listen, they don't just understand, but also, also um, support them in practice. Mm. So yeah, this is, um, this is what we came across when uh, working in these workshops with people with disabilities. Um, and I think it's a very important part of the projects. I think experiences of people with disabilities is um, actually one of the key uh, points of this project and should be pointed out. And um, I'm very happy that uh, we were able to do this. So uh, thank you. And uh, I don't know if we have comments and questions now or later. Thank you. Oops. Thank you so much, um, Andras, Katarina. I think that that was really a um, very eye-opening and insightful into particularly the situation in institutions and the contribution that social work can make um, to advancing the rights of people. We know this came up consistently with partners on this project that people living in institutions face particularly high barriers and particular institutional culture and dynamic that makes it so much harder for them um, to report crimes and to, uh, to get justice. Um, and thank you. I would also like to thank you for the models that you put together for the tool chest. You will find these in the tool chest, the two images that Andra showed that um, have been really helpful for us in trying to visualize and conceptualize how and what types of support are needed and how they should be provided. So I would really recommend um, referring to those. Um, so thank you both. And I would like now to hand over um, uh, to Kristina Shulkova. She is a lawyer at the Forum for Human Rights in Czechia and Slovakia. And she, they had a particular experience in, in the contribution to the tool chest in developing easy read materials and then taking that out for consultation. And um, Christina, we're very much looking forward to hearing from you about that. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Paula said, my name is Christina Shulkova and I'm working as a lawyer at a Forum. And today I would like to talk about you with, with about our experience with easy to read materials, uh, which we were presenting during our multidisciplinary workshop. Uh, now I will try to share share my screen with you and hi, I hope you can see. So I would like to start with uh, experience of our stakeholders because they have direct experience uh, with victims with disabilities. Uh, and one of the social worker uh, told us that uh, the police can't communicate with victims with psychosocial disabilities uh, because clients often can change their statements. And if they do so, for police, their statement is described as inconclusive because, the re for example, because they just didn't identify the perpetrator. So due to the story, I think we can see how it is important to communicate well with victims, with not only with victims with disabilities, but with all vi victims. And due to experience of our stakeholder, stakeholders, we can see that the main problem in, in practice uh, is caused by communication barriers. And these barriers stand between law if in enforcement authorities or other legal professionals and people with disabilities especially victims with disabilities. And these communication barriers, unfortunately, lead to low support of active involvement of victims with disabilities. In fact, victims with disabilities are rather treated as object of the whole criminal proceedings than the active subject that could bring something important to the proceedings. Uh, and then due to this, there is very important role of guardians that are representing people with disabilities. And we think that 
this is not the right uh, access. This is not the right approach we should have to victims with disabilities. Because when they come to the police to report the crime, it's very important. This stage is the most important in the criminal proceedings. And if we won't communicate with victims right at that stage, then they won't have any access to justice. And that's why we and you that's why we decided to create uh, our tool chest, which is co which consists of easy to read materials. Because, for example, as we can see, another story of attorney who was calling for creating easy to read materials that would be comprehensible for uh, people with disabilities. Because usually the attorneys told us that uh, victims has to are are has to communicate only they are communicate uh, the police is communicating with victims only formally by formal documents which are written in legal text and um, it's it's clear that they can't understand it at all and for victims with, with disabilities it's very traumatic to be unable to read and perceive text properly at the police station then they can't have any access to justice so the main communication barrier in practice, as I said, are, are that the provision of information is very formal. Usually it's only a form of document and there is no easy to read version. Uh, the provision of information is moreover based only on personal approach. This, this means that there are police officers, judges or prosecutors that try to communicate with victims with disabilities in accessible way but it's only based on their personal approach and i think that or we think that the system shouldn't be based on personal approach but we should be able to provide to victims with disabilities accessible information and then the provision of information is only did once usually while reporting while reporting a crime and then it's there is no provision of information about your rights and so on. So we think that the provision of information should be continuous during the whole criminal proceedings. And to reach these goals, we decided, and to reach this goal, we decided uh, to create our easy to read materials. They are done by Lucia Tangarova, who has direct experience with people with disabilities. And we, in cooperation with her, we created five easy to read materials. Uh, they should, they are for, they are, they are uh, specialized for people with disabilities, but they can be used as well by professionals uh, like attorneys, judges, prosecutors, police officer, and so on, and as well as by social workers, by victim support services, NGOs. Simply, we can say by everyone. Uh, who needs to communicate with victim uh, with disabilities or by victims with disabilities themselves who needs to orient and help in their difficult situation and we try to, to design these materials so they can be interactively used by professionals and by people with disabilities and we uh, during our cross-disciplinary workshop we work with these materials we organize uh, five events for people with disabilities. Usually there will self-advocate and as there are also social workers who are working with them and we want their feedback and we wanted to see if this could really help them. Mm, and during our workshops, we find out that it's, it's really, really helpful that, they, that these people are calling for such materials. Uh, that's why we also decided to create a website where all the materials uh, should be uh, for downloading. So we want to disseminate these materials as much as possible. We want to cooperate with other NGOs just to share it and to they could use these materials because that's something that they are missing at the moment. And we can see, I will introduce now our materials. We can see the first uh, the design of the first material who is called who is who uh, 
I apologize, I apologize. Uh, the first material are stories about who is the victim. And we designed these materials uh, in the way that people could identify with this. So we can see a story of victim who is called Lucy and uh, he is uh, situated in the psychiatric hospital. And we can see the description of her situation. And there is, a, it's a, in a form of comics and we can see that something bad has happening to her because she had to be in the cage bed for a long, longer time than it is permitted. She's forced to eat pills uh, without uh, her consent and so on. So there is a dis description of uh, some situation and we created let's eight stories and uh, for and every story is different, has a different, there's a different crime commit, committed. And we think that due to these stories, people with dis disabilities can identify with them and maybe it can help them or, and encourage them to share uh, their stories in easiest way with, for example, pro with police or with different professionals. So we see these stories as a way how people with disabilities or, or victims with disabilities can communicate their difficult uh, situation. The second uh, easy to read material uh, is about victim rights. Uh, and it's designed as a lift of the victi victims' rhyme and their description. For example, the right to be heard, uh, the right for protection of, uh, of your privacy, um, and so on. Uh, so due to these rights, uh, the victims with disabilities can orient what can they do, what they has right for. So we think that the basic uh, basic information about the right, which is very important because usually at the police station, they only give them a document, which is a list of sections. And it's hard to understand, I would say for everybody to it and not to people with disabilities. The third material is called who is who. And uh, there is, uh, you can see there a police officer and we have their introduction about his job, what he is doing and what you can expect from, from him. But uh, we design uh, in this way, all professionals and all uh, law enforcement authorities that you can meet uh, during the criminal proceedings. So we, in the similar way, we created the role of prosecutor, judge, uh, attorney, uh, social worker, guardian, and so on. So due to this material, uh, victims with disabilities are prepared and can, are in, are, can be, uh, has better a knowledge of who they can meet during the criminal proceedings. And I think this could help them to orient during the, during the whole criminal proceeding. Uh, the fourth material is about the criminal procedure and how uh, it is conducted. And we created, we created it as a comic stories. Uh, and the first is concentrated on the situation when a victim goes to the police station in order to report uh, the crime. Uh, the second uh, comic situation is about the pre-trial phase. And the third is, uh, the third situation is about the situation uh, during the trial. So you can see that there are pictures, so it should be uh, accessible for victims with disabilities. And we try to describe the situations that can happen during the stages as much as possible. There is a detail of, uh, of the first story when a victim of crime goes to, with her guardian to the police station in order to report the crime. So there is very detailed uh, description of situation, what can happen, what to tell, what not to tell uh, about the rights, for example, that you, you can say you are afraid and you don't want to talk about things. So we try to explain uh, via these stories how people with disabilities can behave during the, uh, during the reporting the crime. And we think that this could be used also uh, by police at the police station and they could explain 
uh, to victims with disabilities, their routes, what they can do, what will be next, and so on. So we, we think that uh, this could be really, really useful as well as for professionals. And the uh, last easy trade material is about what happens after the trial is finished. And we created these possibilities, what can happen after finishing the court uh, proceedings. And uh, there is also a vocab uh, of terms that, that are legal terms and that can be hardly understand. For example, who is the innocent uh, person? Uh, what is a court trail and so on. So there is explanation of all legal legal terms that you can meet uh, in our easy to read uh, materials. And we also want people with disabilities to work interactively with this, as I've already said. And that's why we created a blank page for them. And they could also print our mater material from our web page and they could uh, work with it as they as with their own story so they can put their own photo they can uh they can draw their story maybe instead of talking uh, for some victims it can be better than just talking about it uh more more times and as we were testing these easy to read materials we get uh, many feedback from our participants and usually social workers were very glad that some materials like that are uh, existing because they were calling for this for a, little, a really long time. Usually they told us they would need more uh, materials like that. Uh, for example, specialized for the senior groups or other disability groups and that they would need maybe even more practical training uh, with more law information because they try to support people with disabilities but they are not lawyers so sometimes it's very difficult for them to protect their, their rights and uh, many people from uh, uh, victim support services said that they would need more material like that even more complex because it's very difficult to um, to catch all the criminal proceeding issue into five comics. Uh, but we would say that the main impact of workshop and of created tools was that fortunately professionals have materials that enable them to communicate with victims with disabilities because that's the main problem why victims with disabilities are just a passive part of the criminal proceedings and not the active subjects. And due to these materials as well, the victims have can better understand their rights and their situation, and they can better describe what happened to them. And we think that it's really, really important because without this, we can't protect that they will have access to justice. And other benefits, I would say they are also very important is that there is a change for change, I would say, chance for change, I would say, because many social workers and people from victim support services are really desperate about the situation when they see that police don't care about what their client said just because he has a disability. So I think that they are happy that somebody is interesting about the issue of people with disabilities at even lawyers, and that somebody is creating and trying to change something. And the second very important thing is that due to the workshops, we could provide a certain training for professionals, how to communicate with people with disabilities, because there are not enough uh, education in that area, which should be provided, and it would need more systematic changes. But uh, due to these materials, we can reach some change without big system changes, I would say, because if we will disseminate these materials, everybody could use them. And maybe that due, due to this project, we can raise the awareness of disability issue because still people with disabilities are facing 
a big stigmatization in our society. And that's the biggest fact, I would say, in the whole uh, criminal justice system. And maybe that's the biggest answer for the question why we don't communicate with them, because we assume that if they have a disability, they can't bring anything important to the criminal proceeding. But of course, it, it's not true. And I think that due to dissemination of this material and due to the organizing of workshop, we could demonstrate the importance of disability issue and the importance of having some communication tool to, for people with disabilities. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Christina, thank you so much. Um, it was really, um, it was amazing to see such uh, the materials that you've been working on and producing and the level of creativity and thought that's gone into them. Um, I, I know how difficult it is to simplify and make accessible these complex uh, justice processes, um, let alone uh, trying to make materials that are appropriate and sensitive to people who are victims of crime. Um, and I really hope that materials like this can, can, will inspire others. And also I'm really delighted to hear uh, that in the consultations, people really could identify uses for this material beyond uh, people with disabilities. And I would really hope that materials like this can just be a really important stage in making justice more accessible for everybody. Um, so it can really set new standards. So thank you very much for that, for your presentation. Um, I would like to just hand quickly over to Stephen Allen, who's the Executive Director of Validity, for a few words about Validity. Thank you very much, Paula. Um, and let me just take this opportunity um, to thank everyone who has attended today. Um, but more importantly, I think, uh, members of the consortium who Validity has had the privilege to work alongside over the last two and a half years, essentially filling in that blank space or um, in the words um, of our senior expert, Gabor Gombosch, who sadly passed away last year, this joint endeavor to humanize justice. I think for me, one of the most striking components of this project has absolutely been about hearing the voices of victims of crime with disabilities themselves. At the core of uh, the European Union's work in the criminal justice space, there is an objective to ensure the right to communicate and the right to information for all victims. But sadly, as this project has shown, our justice systems remain slow to become more accessible. They remain unable to tear down those systemic barriers which result in discrimination, not just in the justice system, but of course, more widely in our communities, in social care institutions, and in our societies. I'm reminded of Gabor's clarion call in this project, and I think we should take that forward with us as we use this tool chest to demand the equal uh, citizenship and the equal hearing of people with disabilities um, in justice process. And he says, the justice system and its symbols are scary. And he says, in most places, courts are not about justice, they are about power. For anyone facing these symbols of power, it can be disabling. Let's start thinking about defocusing this power. The focus needs to be on justice. It is really about the humanization of the justice system itself and making it accessible for all. I hope that you find the tool chest a very useful and practical resource to really ensure the greater accessibility to justice for people with disabilities. And on behalf of Validity, I can say we will be using the learnings from this project to input directly into the revisions that are currently underway of the European Union's own Victims' Rights Directive, because it is important that our justice systems properly reflect all parts of our societies, 
including all persons with disabilities. So thank you very much again. Thank you, Paola. Thank you to all of the partners. Thank you to everyone who has attended today. And I'd also like to, to thank everyone who has helped to make this webinar um, as accessible as it has been today. Of course, we will be publishing it too, to make sure that even more can access it after this. Thank you very much. Over to you, Paula. Thank you, Stephen, so much. Um, and I think that really highlights how important this work and this tool chest is. I would commend you to uh, check out our website, download it, look at it, review it, come back to us. And I really uh, look forward to hearing from you about um, its usefulness and um, how you are able to put it to use with your developments, your ideas, and the, the future sort of future trajectory of this tool chest. So thank you all so much for attending. Um, and thank you uh, to the interpreters and the captioners as well. Thank you. And have a great afternoon. <laughs>